Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to DNews Plus for episode two of three on leaving Earth. Because it's gonna happen. So far we've talked about how we find habitable planets and why we have to leave. So if you don't know why we have to leave, go back, figure that out and watch the episode. We're also going to talk about what plans we have for leaving Earth and if we could terraform a planet to fit our needs at all. Can we do that? And also, what would a society on another planet even look like? It's going to be really, really cool. Make sure you subscribe so you get all the episodes. Let's kick into it. So let's say we find somewhere we want to go. You know, we've chosen to leave. We've got some people who want to go there, but the conditions on that planet aren't exactly what we need to survive. Can we tweak them? People who are familiar with a lot of real-time strategy and science fiction probably have heard the term terraforming, the idea that you can change a planet to make it better for you. It's been featured all throughout science fiction. It's kind of hard to find that perfect place, so terraforming does come into play even just slightly, right? Making an imperfect place perfect. Let me tell you a quick story. Kid Trace, little Kid Trace, like maybe 10 years old, thought global warming, it's damaging our planet, it's making it deadly since the 1800s. Nice job, humans. Why not put carbon spewing factories on Mars, thicken up their atmosphere, it'll nice, you know, a little warm up, like a little warm blanket on Mars. Not a bad idea, little trace. Scientists have thought about it. We can't just pop over there, though. It's kind of far. There's also no atmosphere or a planetary dynamo to hold the atmosphere in place. Uh, there's not enough gravity. There's a number of other things, but whatever. Nice job, little 10-year-old trace. But scientists are thinking about this stuff really seriously. So let's talk about Mars first. Mars, it's probably our best bet for a lifeboat planet. It's pretty void and desolate though. Basically, we would need to cut the UV, raise the temperature and pressure of the atmosphere, introduce water and fix that atmosphere to make it Earth-like. It's a lot of stuff. Mars's atmosphere is 95% carbon dioxide, almost 3% nitrogen, a little less in argon, very little oxygen, 0.13%, and a little bit carbon monoxide. Its atmosphere is 100 times thinner than Earth's. It even has trace elements of other stuff, but that's not as important. That thin atmosphere and being further from the sun makes Mars way cold. Atmospheres are like planetary blankets. I was joking earlier, but not really, because it keeps the heat in. It's what our planet does all the time. The average temperature is about minus 80 degrees Fahrenheit or about minus 60 Celsius on Mars. And it can change pretty drastically. In a Martian summer, it's not too bad. It's 27 Celsius, you know, nice balmy day. But in the winter, it can get really, really, really cold. The atmosphere is still thick enough to support weather and clouds and wind and stuff, but not much. Because it's so thin, if you were to somehow walk onto Mars without a spacesuit, the low pressure would make your blood boil. It would be bad. Not like in a hot way, but it would like become a gas, it, not, not good. There are hopes of making Mars more Earth-like by terraforming, essentially changing the climate for human colonization. It first was actually proposed in science fiction. Arthur C. Clarke, my boy, love that guy, Sands of Mars. Uh, Martian settlers heated Mars by converting Mars's moon Phobos into a second sun and growing plants there to break down Martian sands and release oxygen. This is obviously not that realistic science fiction. Beyond fiction writing though, other ideas have come about. In 1964, Dandridge M. Cole outlined a plan to take ammonia, or NH3, from the outer solar system and have it rain down or crash into Mars. He thought this would thicken up the atmosphere and raise the Martian temperature. That's a big deal, since ammonia is a powerful greenhouse gas. It would also help create a breathable atmosphere for humans and add nitrogen, which is great. Another theory though, that I really like, take a fantastically large asteroid from the asteroid belt next door to Mars, strap a big engine to it, and then point it at Mars. Once it smashes into Mars, it would create a temperature increase on Mars by about three degrees Celsius, melt a trillion gallons of water already present on the planet, thicken the atmosphere, and it has an added bonus of introducing oxygen. Win, 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 win. Except, of course, grabbing an asteroid, strapping an engine to it, smashing it into another planet. That's, that's a little harder. There are a bunch of different thoughts and ideas throughout the years of how to terraform a planet. Most have something to do with introducing a greenhouse gas, shout out 10 year old Trace, or uh, CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons, to trigger global warming effects. But more recently, experts were thinking of terraforming Mars by freeing heat trapped carbon dioxide from the Martian crust back into the atmosphere. Essentially what we're doing with oil, but doing that 
there on Mars. And it actually seemed pretty feasible until you look at the results from NASA's MAVEN, Mars Atmosphere and Volatile Evolution mission from late 2015. I'm sure you've all looked at those results. I know I have now. Uh, and that showed that the CO2 levels on Mars went up and then not down after its atmosphere was stripped away. That's right, its atmosphere was stripped away by the sun. The solar wind pulled the atmosphere off the planet. It didn't have an electromagnetic field like we do, generated by the core of the Earth spinning, they think, to you know, protect us. It also didn't have enough gravity to hold on to all of those molecules. According to the principal investigator of the NASA MAVEN mission, Bruce Joukowsky, those molecules have been removed from the solar system entirely. It's not possible to bring it back, it being Mars's atmosphere. Oh, and by the way, any of these strategies, whether it's an asteroid with a giant engine or a you know, greenhouse gassing up Mars or something, we'd have to figure all of this out, remember, from earlier. By 2050, when the population hits too much for Earth to stand, we're running out of time, guys. Most terraforming plans are not nearly as fast as Total Recall's few minute planetary change. You gotta do more than that. Also, original Total Recall, don't even start with me. Plus the planet is still too small and has no electromagnetic field, so even if we did build an atmosphere on Mars, the sun would slowly throw it away like socks in a dryer, they just disappear. So Mars, not as great when you get down to the brass tacks. But what about the moon? Can we live on that? It's closer, right? One of the first times the idea of living on the moon was more than just science fiction was actually pretty recently in the year 2000. NASA published a study and they found that a colony could be dug under the surface of the moon and still be okay. Or in an existing crater, you just cover it over. So inhabitants wouldn't be bombarded by that harmful cosmic radiation and since the moon has no atmosphere at all, you would have to build something anyway. Luckily, dirt is actually a pretty good reducer of radiation as well. Nuclear fallout can be blocked by like a foot, a foot and a half of dirt or concrete. And packed at the right density, a 2008 study by NASA's Lunar Science Institute found that lunar regolith can also do that. It can also block radiation. So if they go underground, they would have a lot of radioactive insulation from these cosmic solar particles. But recently, the idea of colonizing the moon has resurfaced, ah, pun intended. There was this one idea from professor of astrology and geology at Mount Holyoke College, Darby Diar. She says, the moon is to people today what the new world was to Europeans 600 years ago. It wasn't a direct quote, but paraphrasing. Here is a direct quote though. Quote, they had been there a few times, but it took time to work up the courage and send people there to stay. And that's just what people are planning to do. In early 2016, a group of space experts that included leading NASA scientists outlined a plan to colonize the moon by as early as 2022. That's really soon. That's like not the next Winter Games, but the one right after that. You know, six, like six, seven years, that's crazy. And they could do this for only $10 billion. But the moon, that's not the end goal. The moon is just a starting point. It's used to get a base off of Earth to help us get to a point where we can go colonize other planets like Mars. According to Chris McKay, the same Chris McKay that we quoted earlier, quote, we are not going to have a research base on Mars until we can learn how to do it on the moon first. The moon provides a blueprint to Mars. The research papers included in the study outlined the plan. The lunar base would house around 10 people for a year at first, and they were hoping it could become self-sufficient and have maybe 100 people within 10 years. I mean, that's amazing. People are literally planning to do this. We live in the future right now. I love this. Good old Elon Musk is gonna help them get there too. SpaceX's Falcon Heavy rocket would transport them to the moon with a hefty payload of everything that they might need initially, all of the water and carbon and everything we were mentioning earlier. And then basically everything they would need after that would be 3D printed in terms of the tools that they would need. There's another series we've been wanting to do, uh, 3D printing, so let us know if you think that that's still interesting and cool. They also have a nice spot already picked out for this colony in their paper, somewhere on the outer rim of one of the moon's poles because the sun would be there. They could solar power a lot of stuff and living near the poles would provide a ton of power, 24 hour sun, essentially. Power for robots to collect ice and humans that need ice because it has water to survive. Speaking of water, by the way, remember Darby Jar? Of course you do, I said it just a few minutes ago. She is serving on the Solar System Exploration Research Virtual Institute, and she's working out how and where we can find water on the moon. 
She says that water on the moon can come from a few different places. Some, it's locked in the minerals in super tiny amounts. Basically, it's been there since the moon formed, and it's by super tiny, like we're talking real tiny. Some could have come from comets, but comets, you know, they're made of ice, so we can just capture some of those, hopefully. But another way that I found to get water on the moon that was super interesting is from the solar wind. And this is how she describes it, quote, Solar wind is composed of highly charged particles, some of which are hydrogen ions that bond with microscopic particles. They are spraying the moon all the time, and sometimes they stick. So if we can capture that hydrogen, mix it with a little oxygen, we got ourselves some water. And that is a crazy solution. So we've got people on the moon, we've got water, we know pretty much where they would live, but what would they live in, right? We have to build stuff. They would most likely live in something like a Bigelow Aerospace Inflatable Habitat, there's one called the B-330. It's an expandable or inflatable habitat. NASA was testing one with the TransHab, and it can house up to six people. It has a 20-year lifespan, 330 meters of usable volume, which is pretty good. It also has 18-inch thick walls, so you don't have to worry about radiation. That's actually more than the ISS. But again, this is all the plan for the moon or Mars, which we can't do. So what about other than our neighbors? What do we do? Well, again, Every planet is different. Every star is different. Every orbit is different. Every planet is going to have different considerations. What we do know is we know how to build certain things that can be used to make planets more habitable. This is why most of our constructions are little bubbles and things, you know, in science fiction. But what if we think bigger, right? What if we encased a whole planet? in something that we know would terraform that planet. By encasing a whole planet in a shell made of Kevlar, dirt, and steel, as proposed by engineer Ken Roy in late 2013, we would be able to have radiation protection, heating and cooling would be controlled, the length of the day wouldn't be dependent on the orbit of the planet around its star. It's also crazy. It's a crazy plan, but then that's kind of far off. Another terraforming plan was to build 200,000 pound mirrors in space to reflect sunlight onto planets like Mars, because that could heat it up and be more comfy. I don't think this is worth it, you guys. This sounds really complicated. But we still have to leave Earth. We still have to go. So why don't we just skip over the terraforming part? Because it looks like it would take hundreds of years to terraform a planet, both in coming up with the technology and figuring out how to do it. And even if we crashed an asteroid into Mars, it's not like Mars is going to clear out in five minutes and be ready to go. You know, it's going to take a long time to terraform any planet. And we only have till 2050 when we run out of food. So we got to start figuring this out. Plus asteroids, they could show up at any time. So let's just assume we have a habitable planet somewhere and assume that we can get there. Then what? If we leave Earth, what does this new place look like? What is, who gets to go? What are they going to do when they get there? Are they one nation? Are they a new society? Do we have country allegiances? Are there like Japanese people and Americans and Russians and South Africans, you know, and Brazilians? Or are they just all Terra Novans or something? And then looking way down the line, how is that planet going to affect and transform humanity as a whole? Are we going to evolve by going there? I mean, this is crazy. Why don't you let us know your thoughts on these questions down in the comments, because some of these are open questions and some of these we have ideas about. So make sure that you come back for tomorrow's episode to find out what those are and participate in the conversation down in the comments, because that's like half the fun of doing these videos. Again, thanks so much for tuning into DNews Plus, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow.